welcome to today's 3D print. You want prints like this? You want pretty prints? Then we have to talk about perimeters and support. Welcome to today's 3D print. All 3D printing revolves around support because additive printing is printing one layer on top of another layer that requires support. We have two kinds of support. You have exterior support for overhangs, but you also have interior overhangs, and that's taken care of by support as well. We call it infill. You can also fudge a little bit with perimeters, and we're going to talk about both of those. So I'm going to pause you for a moment, and we're going to switch to the look down view. This is something new. I also don't know if I can keep this under 11 minutes because I'm doing this piecemeal, so I don't know the actual total time of the video until it's done. So hopefully this will work. Um, when you extrude plastic, you have to understand how the plastic extrudes first. It extrudes as a cylinder of plastic. This is, on typical printers, 0.4 millimeters across. Okay. Now you're thinking, okay, 0.4 millimeter plastic, can't I do 2.4 millimeter layers? No. Because when you put a second layer on top of this one, 0.4 millimeters away, they touch by what's called a, a tangent, a contact point. There's no layer contact. It's two circles touching, so it's two points touching. That's the minimum possible contact area you can have. Not only would this be very weak, you'd be able to zipper this thing right apart if it even held together at all. The Ender 2 might be able to get away with this for a vertical wall, but most printers don't have the layer alignment resolution to actually make that even attempt to work. It won't. You typically don't want to go past 75%, so on this one you would actually want 0.3. So you'd want this to be 0.3, but we're going to get to that in a minute. Now, when you make that extrusion, you also can only make a vertical wall using that. You can't go sideways, because what happens when you make a 0.4 millimeter and then you go up 0.4 millimeters and you make another 0.4 millimeter. Remember, it's not 0.4 millimeter from this one. It's 0.4 millimeter from the bed level of the previous one. If you'll notice, these don't touch. There's a gap here. That's because it's a point contact. They only touch where the tangent is, meaning one directly above the other. So the moment your second layer moves off axis from the vertical of the first layer, you have no contact whatsoever. Your filament doesn't stick at all. This creates other problems even at lower layer heights. We'll get to that in a moment. When you extrude plastic, you're extruding a layer 0.4 millimeter wide and only 0.2 millimeter tall. So 0.4 by 0.2 is your typical. Now, this works great for a lot of prints. And the reason is, your plastic comes out like this, flat with a curve and flat with a curve. So that when you put the next layer on top of it, it looks like this, and it looks like this, and it looks like this. This is obviously not to scale of any sort, but as you can see, there's a huge amount of contact area between these two layers where they're touching. That's a huge contact patch. That part is very, very strong. But even that part has a problem. If I want to print a layer here, and then I want to print a layer here, I now have half the contact patch, and this layer here is overhanging. So it tends to want to droop down a little bit. Okay, You will see that in prints that you make, such as a Marvin. If you look on the left side of the Marvin here, on one of your own Marvins, you'll see that there's a little bit of droop, like it's not perfectly edged, not perfectly straight, and that's because of this. You're overhanging one filament line on another line, and that plastic by gravity wants to droop a little bit. You can get away with this to a pretty large extent. If I try to go even further, even more of the plastic is overhanging. That's why sometimes, you'll, if you have a smart slicer, you'll see it draw a line, draw a line, draw a line, and then you'll see the printer come back and go it'll make this little wide section. It's doing that to provide a shelf for the next layer to sit on. It's doing that so that you don't get this, where it falls apart. That's the reason it's doing that. And that's also why if your slicer doesn't do that, why it will fail on a print. It gets more complicated. Now there's two ways to compensate for this. You can lower the layer height. If you lower the layer height, the amount you have to move over to do this layer and this layer 
becomes less if you have more layers. So if you only have a slight overhang issue, you can decrease your layer height to 0.12, and that will take care of some of the overhang issues. But sometimes even that's not enough. Sometimes you wanna take your layer and overhang it a little too much, and there's just nothing here to support it. They can theoretically touch, because remember, they're flattened a little bit. I'm exaggerating here for the video. Well, that's where infill comes in. When you draw your infill, you are giving a place for this new layer to sit. Right? That's why that's important. So it's a combination of both infill, layer height, and shells. So this is infill. Actually, I need to make it this way. It's inverted. Okay. So this is an example of perimeters. Two, four, and six, and eight. So this is two perimeters. They're 0.4 millimeter each, which means this is a 0.8 millimeter wall. So in um, Simplify 3D, I would tell it two perimeters. With a 0.4 millimeter line width and 0.4 millimeter nozzle in Cura, you would tell it wall thickness of 0.8. Same thing. In Simplify 3D, I'd tell it four shells. In Cura, you would say 1.6 millimeter wall thickness. Here's eight shells, which I've actually never used, but it's to show the exaggeration between them. I would tell Simplify 3D eight perimeters. You would tell Cura, eight times 0.4, or double this, 3.2 millimeter, okay? So 0.8, 1.6, and 3.2 millimeter wall thicknesses. Now, that's how I cheated on a print like the moon. The moon has these craters. These craters are, if you look inside, they're inside as well. These are technical overhangs. And the reason I have some of this string is because every now and then there's one of these craters that comes in at just the right depth, at just the right point where there is nothing underneath it to support the plastic. So the plastic breaks free because it's not attached to anything and you end up with these strings. I compensated for that by increasing the number of perimeters because even though you might draw something with no support underneath it, a small amount of that will be supported by the simple hardening and elasticity of the plastic itself. That's why cooling is important. Um, so by having multiple layers, each of these successive layers will successfully get out a little bit farther, building on the previous one. And so by using four perimeters to print this, the inside perimeter basically becomes a sacrificial perimeter. It is the one that fails, allowing the other three to succeed, giving me a successful print without using any infill. Okay, the other way I could have done this was to use infill. But a print like this, with all these little micro details, would take an extraordinary amount of infill. So here's a description of infill. You have none, 5, 10, 20, 30, 50, 80, and 100%. As you can see on most printers, 80 is effectively 100%. There is actually gaps in here, but they're pretty hard to see, and this camera won't focus close enough for you to truly see that. But this gives you an idea of infill. So none would be nothing. Now, if you have small perturbations like the moon, you can compensate with perimeters. If you have small perturbations like the wish, you can compensate for support by adding enough layers. This has three perimeters, and that's enough because this print, this print was optimized to print for 3D printing. So the technical overhangs aren't that extreme, and they're light enough by simply increasing the perimeters, I can eliminate all problems. I probably could have got away with two, but I'd rather go safe and go with three because this is like a 35 hour print. Okay, now on something like this, you can see where the perimeters wasn't enough. You can see some of the webbing let go there. You can see there's a couple little head, holes on the top of the head and little issues here on the body. Okay, no big deal, but little tiny holes. My big one doesn't have that problem, even though it also has no infill. And it's bigger, which makes the problem worse. But I got around that by increasing the number of perimeters which gives me a little bit of an edge for infill. Sometimes you have no choice. You have to add infill. So for example here, no amount of perimeters is gonna print this flat section. Unless I did it solid with 100 perimeters, <laughs> then it would work, but that's basically 100% infill. So I have to have infill to support these top items here that are sitting on a flat surface. How much infill? Well, you could just go safe and go 25% between this and this. 25% grid both ways infill will support pretty much anything you're going to print, but it also uses a lot of plastic. 
and you don't want to use a lot of plastic uh, well, I guess you can if you want if you want a heavier model if you want a bulkier sturdier model use more infill but when you're printing stuff this big you're talking about the difference between 270 grams and two pounds that's a lot of plastic especially when it's 25 dollars a kilo so how much infill well that's easy you have to well it's not easy but it's easy to understand once you understand it so let's say I'm gonna print this and I want to print this on top of this okay let's add some infill let's add 10% See the problem? Wherever there's infill, you're fine. It'll draw wherever it crosses over fine. But the ends of these petals are unsupported. So when it prints them, the plastic's gonna fall inside because it's gonna droop down from gravity because there's nothing underneath. The inside of this square is empty. So this part of the flower isn't supported. Now a section like you know this here is gonna be fine. A section like this might even be fine because it's a relatively straight line over a short gap. This isn't going to work. So let's increase it to 25%. As you can see, we get far better grid coverage of the model. And there's more, these lines that are unsupported are becoming more like straight lines. They're becoming more like bridging. Okay, they're, they're, the segments are straight. That's the trick. If the segment curves between two support lines, between two infill lines, that's when you have a droop. So you can have infill here and here, and you draw a line like this across it, you're fine. This is a bridge going from here to here. Straight line, cross two points, you're okay. But if that line curves, well now the curve isn't supported by anything. It's not held by tension of the plastic going across and it's not supported by anything underneath. So you need enough infill to turn it into straight line bridging segments. Now remember, it's not going to be perfect. This is still a curve, but it'll be close enough that when the second layer is added, the less than perfect first layer will support the second layer, which will be a little more perfect and your imperfection will be hidden inside the model. So you don't have to go with 100% infill. You just have to go with enough infill to eliminate the obvious unsupported arcs across the infill lines. So I typically use 25% grid both ways. Now some models you can get away with less. So for example, I think in here I used 15%. It didn't need as much because it's mostly straight lines going across. So the bottom didn't need as much infill. But that's your basics on infill and um, support which is support and perimeter walls so if your perturbations are small you can just thicken up your outer shell to compensate for that if you're trying to print something on top of a large area well then you need to support that underneath so that it can print okay so these changes here are shallow enough that they can be supported by the layer underneath these areas here are flat areas. These areas here between the webbed feet, these are flat areas. They really need support from underneath. So for this model, I should have either added two more perimeters or add support where needed with infill underneath to support these layers as they print so they don't pull apart. Okay? I hope that explains it well enough for you to get started. I'll do more detailed videos in the future as I understand the terminology better and can express that better to you guys. If you have any questions, by all means, please answer below. Not only do I like answering questions, but sometimes questions invoke ideas for new videos. You guys have a great night.